questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Hi, and welcome to the Q&A show here on the Wednesday evening. And I'm joined this evening by John Mackay. It's good to see you. Good day, mate. Good to be back with you again. OK, you've got the replacement, Howard, this evening. So uh, we were talking this morning on uh, our mornings, weren't we? Yes. And uh, very interesting conversation. I really we enjoyed and, it. Uh, tonight, of course, it's the cloned Howard, isn't it? It's it is the cloned Howard, yes, indeed. And, yeah. and yeah. The, the original and only John Mackay. So it's good to That's be with right. you, Howard. <laughs> So anyway, tonight we're going to be looking at all sorts of things about geology and the time of the Earth, age of the Earth, should I say, and all of those sort of things, fossils. And we're interested in your emails and your questions, and we want to hear what you want to ask John. And John, you will do your best to answer them. I will, and there's one other thing too, because we had so many emails pour in last night and a hitch with the transmission of them, right. those folks who uh, sent stuff in last night, if you want to resend it again, if you didn't get answered, we're, we're, we're open to it, aren't we? I bet we are indeed. That's send good. them in again and we're hopefully this... Oh, they're rolling already. Already they're coming through. OK, well, before I forget, we had uh, an email that came in just before the programme from Keith, apparently, and he wants to know about, uh, if I get this right, with the age of starlight? OK. Oh, he's just clicked with me what he's asking. Yes, That's okay. good. That's exactly right. right. So, yes. Now, when you think carefully, we live in a planet today and we benefit in the day by a big star we call the sun. We benefit at night from reflected uh, planet light or reflected starlight off a, pla a sub-planet, a moon of Earth, right? right? And then we have these other twinkling things out there and we have a few non-twinkling things. Mm. Well, the old Greeks called the moving ones, the moving stars or planets, which is the old word for moving stars, right. and the other, the asteroid ear, the, the, the sparkling ones, right? So when we have a look at the situation today, the background of this type of question, uh, Howard, is the argument that says the light left the star and it's taken yeah. gazillion years to get from the star, which is so far away, traveling at the speed of light, how could you believe the world was made in just six days if the light's taken 20 million years exactly, to get here? we know the speed of light. Well, not only does it mean we assume we know the speed of light forever and a day, but the, the, the reality is, when you look at this, as I had one professor come to me one day and said, it can't be as simple as you say. And I said, why not, Madam Professor? You, it can't have been made in just six days. That, that's too over naive. And I said, why? And she said, well, what about the Big Bang Theory? And I said, excuse me, Madam Professor, did you just say the Big Bang Theory oh, or did you say the Big Bang Fact? Right. Because if you said the theory, I'll agree with you, everything in your Big Bang Theory contradicts our literal reading of Genesis, but come back when it's the Big Bang Fact. Mm -hmm. Now, Keith, that's the basic dilemma you need to solve. We have lots of things that are theoretical that are actually presented on the BBC and in the science textbook as if they are fact. And the time it's taken light to get from the furthest star is one of them. Let me illustrate some of the times you get caught uh, and then you can work backwards. If you assume, as most people do, that the measurement of the speed of light is the fastest it can go. Remember Einstein? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And then you work backwards. Light behaves as a wave. If it's going away from us, the source, it will go to red shift. If it's coming towards us, it'll go to blue shift. And there's all sorts of other things we build in to make our picture of a billions of years old universe. OK, all you need to do is go to our normal Q&A site, the askjohnmackay.com website, and what you'll find, there's several questions there that deal with starlight. Let me give you a summary of one of them, which should make you go away and think, and if that's all we achieve on this program, that's great, isn't it, Howard? OK, because the God of the Bible says you'll love me with your mind, so we don't mind your questions, but we do want you to think as a result of our answers. You can, there's a thing called the visually observable universe. How big is it? Now, at the moment, the estimate of the size of it is about 50 billion light years across. OK, so what? Uh, we don't know if that's the full size, but that's the maximum uh, size we can sort of visually observe. That would be the distance that light would travel in 50 billion years. That, that's big, Howard, yeah. really big. Yeah. OK, so what you'll find next is, when did the Big Bang happen? Well, several things appear. Number one, the current figure is 13.7 billion years ago, based on the observations of the Hubble Space Telescope, etc., etc. But that means, of course, if you had a blob of hydrogen blowing up 
and turning into all of the galaxies and novas and you name it in the last 13.7 billion years, then starting from one point and traveling at the speed of light, the maximum size of that big bang result is going to be 27 and a half billion years across. And yet it's not. It's at least 50 billion. Conclusion, the speed of light must have been faster in the past or else something's really messed up when it comes to our understanding of light. And I'll tell you what I suspect it is, Keith. You see, the Madam Professor who was so upset, she was from Manchester University and claimed to be a Christian, and yet she thought the theory was fact. And I said, look, here's the real problem. You see, the God who was there said, let there be light. And there was no stars till three days later. The Bible says God made the light before he made the stars. But the Big Bang Theory says the stars were there before the light. Here's your contradiction. It's not that you're ending up in a different place. It's the fact that you actually started in a different place. So choice time, Keith, faith in the words of God who were there and start from there doesn't mean you'll solve everything. You haven't solved everything, have you, Howard? Not quite yet. I haven't solved everything either, but it's faith in the words of God who was there or faith in the theories of the astronomers who weren't, who in my lifetime, see this going white hair, Keith? I'm old enough to remember when the universe was 20 billion years old. And then they changed their mind about the value of Hubble's constant and it became 10 billion years old. And then they had a meeting and a week later it was 15 billion years old. So please, Keith, don't expect me to believe any of these figures are facts. Oh, you're right. If they were, you couldn't read Genesis literally. But it's not the facts that contradicts a literal reading of Genesis. It's the latest opinions and theories. Great question from him. Good, good answer. Just while you brought that up, am I right or am I wrong in understanding that many of the, we'll call them secular scientists today, have ditched the idea of the Big Bang Theory anyway? Uh, you will find if you go, say, Google hunting for a man called Arp. Hmm. Arp is a, quite a, a notable astronomer, or should that be notorious? <laughs> uh, a notable astronomer originally in the USA came up with a different interpretation of redshift. Now, the textbooks treat redshift as if it is a fact. Right. You know, light behaves as a wave when a, a train comes toward you and the sound waves get compressed. The frequency of the sound change, it goes, whoop, right? Yeah. And then as it goes away, the sound waves stretch. Excuse me. And if you assume light behaves as a wave, then as it's going away, it stretches, becomes longer, equal red, comes towards you, compresses, equals blue. Right. And yet every one of those students in school learns that light may not always be a wave. Sometimes it may be a particle. Sometimes it may be both. But what if it's neither? And so Arp came up with a new interpretation of redshift. He said, redshift is not caused by the stretching of light, but it's light getting old. Now, the minute you do that, the whole map of the universe changes. Mm. So they need to go Google ARP, but I do have to warn you out there, ARP is an atheist, and he has a hatred for the Big Bang Theory, not only because unless you believe that, you really dip out on research grants, prejudice exists even amongst the researchers, but secondly, you find atheists don't even want to start and the Big Bang Theory at least looks like it had a start. And some of the Christians say, well, God stretched out the heaven, so we'll fit it in there. Well, hang on, make sure you go by the word of God who was there, not just your one or two verses you want to fit in. That's a fair comment. Well, before we go any further, I'll just get the light back on that, or else we probably won't get it in. I'm going to just mention, first of all, this, that we had a little look at this earlier in the program this morning. Time's up, Darwin. And this is the latest DVD yeah, that's from our latest your DVD, as from many folks know over the years. And uh, we'll put our UK website and our phone number up shortly. They can order this because this is broadcast a lot in the UK. And we're going to play the clip on there. It's already loaded up, I believe. So as soon okay. as they've got ready, they can re they can play that again. As long as you can get the nod, I don't know what no, they're telling you. No, that's fine. You tell us when you're ready to do that, and we yeah, will drop so, it in. And basically, what we've done is produce a series of three DVDs: one on rocks one on biology, and this one on how long have things actually taken. Yeah. And so basically we used a lot of scientists, we went around the world and looked at fossils, and we looked at stalactites, and we looked at oil wells, and simply asked them, hey, listen, how long do you need for this to happen? Mm. And in every case, the bottom line is, hey, you don't need time, you need a process. 
and when the process is right, the time is almost irrelevant. So it's a great DVD, Time's Up Darwin, available from our UK phone number, 9am to 9pm basically every day. Right, well we'll show a bit of that a little later in the programme as we break up and give yeah. us a chance to take breath as well. Let's have a quick look at some of these that are coming in. Thanks for your emails. There's one here, curious one here from Tony. It says, the Bible makes reference to God's objection to wasted seed. That must mean that people should only engage in marital activities if it is for procreational purposes. But yet I've heard people say that God does approve of married couples engaging in the act just for pleasure. That would mean some form of contraception and therefore wasted seed. Can you clarify, please? Okay, yeah. when you have a look, say, at Genesis, rather than going to Onan that this singular account is about, and it's really about his attitude as to why he would not honour the woman he was given as wife, right? Mm. Go back to the first marriage and ask, what was God's instruction concerning sex? Mm. Well, you'll find there's really only two commandments that God gave to man in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and one is to you know, have dominion over the planet, mm. and the other is to multiply and fill the earth. Yeah. Now, there is no restriction when God said, now, if you just feel like it, that's not what it's about. Right? Uh, only if you want to have children uh, do, you, do you have sex. So what you'll find is God's instruction to Adam and Eve has no parameters attached to it except, look, you do this and here's going to be the consequence. You'll multiply and fill the earth. Mm. So Eve was made for Adam uh, because Adam was alone. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So the first role of the woman is companionship, comfort, etc. And so therefore God puts no restrictions on sex for pleasure, sex for enjoyment, sex for multiplication mm. of offspring. And there's your basic rule. Don't use Onan, he's thousands of years down the line and he's a specific case whose attitude was wrong and that's why he's judged. Adam and Eve were free to enjoy the benefits and blessings of mutual companionship, sex included. Well, doesn't the Apostle Paul also speak about if you have the urge and it's better to be married and have a partner, he's not just talking about procreation. Well, the bottom, the bottom line in the Bible is a very blunt book, mm. right? Because by the time you get past Adam and Eve, you may remember there's an interesting trend, Howard. So two rules, one thou shalt and one thou shalt not in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And from then on, because man's conscience has degraded, we need more and more rules to tell us what's right. Our conscience is not able to do that fully. And in fact, most governments are adding thousands of rules every year to try and resolve conflict between nations, between people, between communities. And by the time you get to the Apostle Paul, you've gone through the Ten Commandments, you've gone through the other 690 legislations God gave to Moses. You're now thousands of years down the line. And let's be honest, Howard, men and women suffer not just from a desire to have companionship, but just from broad desire. Yes. So Paul writes, it is better to have a wife than to engage in fornication. In fact, he says, to avoid fornication, to avoid illicit sex, let every man have a wife, and you couldn't get blunter than that, That's right. particularly to us blokes. That's right. Yeah, obviously there. This is a nice one there. I don't know when this was sent, John. It's interesting, but it says it could, could be uh, 6,000 years old, I guess. It says, Evening, John. When is the parag paradigm between evolution and creation going to be resolved? God bless, Adam. When is the paradigm going to be resolved? You will find there's two different paradigms and they're head on in collision. Now, nobody knows that better than the man who was interviewed on this program, what was it, 18 months ago, Richard Dawkins, yeah. right? And basically, if you replay that, I don't know if that's still available or whatever, but basically you'll see him saying, the evangelicals have fundamentally got it right, yeah. right? That evolution doesn't fit with the biblical paradigm. The biblical paradigm, God made everything good, evolution, kill or be killed, struggle, there is no mutual ground. So you want to know when the issue will be resolved? The answer is when Richard Dawkins is on his face, when David Attenborough is kneeling behind him, when the director of the BBC and Jimmy Savile, right, mm. are all on their face acknowledging Jesus Christ is Lord, who did create, who didn't lie, mm. who didn't even need six days, but he took six days so that we would have a rule whereby to run our work time and benefit us. That's a good answer. I wasn't sure if that was a flippant email from yeah. Adam. But right. if, if it wasn't, that was a very a good, good answer. Opportunity. Yes, <laughs> very that's good right. Answer. Right, hi, Howard and John. Does John consider the ice man's age to be accurate at about 5,500 years old? 
If so, Adam would have been alive for roughly 400 years after this man died. Seeing as Adam's death would be nearer to us than this individual found in the ice, couldn't the bones of God's first human still be around, if not skeletal, than in some other physical, chemical form? Failing this, his atoms must be. OK, there's a, a multiple question, if I've ever heard. Hopefully you're sending a good donation to Revelation TV <laughs> to cover all the costs. Um, basically, when you look at, say, the ice man, number one, we know he was murdered or killed. Uh, number two, we know he was preserved by freezing slowly. So hence, he's very difficult to study because you have a freezer at home and has a little rule in there. It says, don't keep meat longer than three months because if you freeze meat slowly, then the crystals of water will freeze, puncture the cell walls, the bacteria can get in, and even though it looks solid, as soon as you begin to melt it, it will begin to stink, because it's already rotted, even though it's at such a low temperature. So our Iceman friend is rotted. Secondly, most of the dating, if I remember correctly, and that's quite a while, he hasn't caused the stir for a while, our Iceman, so it's quite a while since I've looked up the data, but they've basically been using both anthropological data as well as the carbon-14 system. And so therefore you'll find that their date will be provably too old. So when you have a think, if his date is five and a half thousand years, then you're right, given the biblical Adam, who was roughly here six to six and a half thousand years or so ago, and Adam lived to be 950, you're quite right, there, there theoretically should be some overlap. But since our ice man is not here till ice arrives on the planet, let's now, instead of using the carbon-14 modern anthropology paradigm, let's put him in a biblical paradigm. Number one, God made the world very good. Number two, Adam and Eve were stark naked. Number three, there was no ice, right? Yeah. There was no ice when Adam died. In fact, by the time you get to Noah, the only words mentioned about the weather are warm and cool, never hot and cold. Genesis chapter nine, uh, chapter eight rather, verse 22, God gives us the first long-term weather forecast. He tells Noah after the flood, after the sky has fallen down, after the CO2 has been dissolved for 40 days and 40 nights at least, from now on there'll be cold, there'll be heat, there'll be summer, there'll be winter. Still no ice. Then you get to the book of Job and Job is asked three questions. One of which was, where did the ice come from Job? Now Job lived at least two or three hundred years after Noah's flood. Right? And so by Job's day, God expected Job to understand the question. Somewhere recently, Job knew ice had arrived on the planet. So your ice man is not going to happen till after the days of Job. So as with most of the carbon-14 dates, if you assume this is the present world and it's always been like this, you'll end up with a, a carbon-14 figure that's way too old. There's the resolution of the conflict. He lived sometime after the days of Job and before now. That's what we really do know. And that, that, that really is showing, as we were talking earlier uh, in the program before, about the uniform utilitarianism. Yep. That's just showing that the, the, the atmosphere, the situation was different in the past. That's and therefore exactly you can't what see what's today and work it backwards. Yeah, so the biblical picture that says 40 days and 40 nights of rain definitely would have interfered with the amount of CO2. Mm. You change the amount of CO2, you change the carbon-14 cycle, mm. you change the carbon-14 cycle. You can't just slot ice man on a normal graph which assumes it's always been the same, right? When it hasn't been. Well, whatever the canopy was changed as well, didn't it? So the whole well, sun, the that, whole thing would have been different. All of that will result in increased radiation, which will, will change the amount of radioactive carbon. Yeah, so that makes a difference. Okay, we've got one here. This is this is uh, this is one that gets asked many times. Uh, if Adam was the first man, who were the people in the land of Nod? Blessings, Peter. That was a Peter, was it? Peter, yeah. Okay, Peter, again, you can go to askjohnmackay.com or creationresearch.net and you will find that we get lots of questions about Adam, right? Not, uh, not uh, misunderstanding because he's, he's the first bloke mentioned in the Bible. What you will find is when you get to Genesis chapter 4, where your question has really come from, it starts, and so Adam knew his wife and she conceived and she said, Behold, I've received a man-child with the help of the Lord and she brought forth Cain. And Cain became a, a, a tiller of the ground and she brought forth Abel and Abel became a, a herdsman, as it were. 
Okay, so what you find is then Cain kills Abel and then Cain goes away and Cain takes a woman and he marries somebody in the land of Nod. Now, it doesn't talk about anybody else living in the land of Nod. All that Cain's statement is he was afraid that people would kill him. And so your real issue is who were the people who could have killed Cain that he was afraid of? Well, number one, you see, Adam and Eve were there when they sinned and Adam and Eve knew that God had slaughtered an innocent animal because the wages of sin is death and God's only other option was to kill them. But a merciful God was willing to substitute the death of another creature so that man might live. The wages of sin is death, a principle. Okay, Adam knew that and understood it. Cain and Abel, the real story is about, hey, Cain was sacrificing cabbages and Abel was sacrificing an animal and God accepted the animal and he rejected the cabbages and carrots. Cain is jealous, Cain kills Abel. Why were they sacrificing? You only give a sacrifice to someone who you're in debt to. What was the debt? The wages of sin is death. Adam's sin was affecting all of them. They were sacrificing, not just thanksgiving, but sacrificing because there was a sin debt, a wages of sin to be paid. So Cain understood this principle as well, and he only got it from mum and dad. Okay, so who was alive to kill Cain, uh, even though he killed his brother? There's at least two. There's Adam and Eve. But then if you keep reading, you discover something about Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Eve has two kids. Verse 3 and 4, they're already herdsmen and farmers. Hey, 20 years has gone past and you assume it's just the same day. No, no, there's 20 years there. Then you go to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4 and you read, so Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Other sons and daughters? You've already heard of three, Cain, Abel and Seth. Abel's dead, that leaves two other sons and daughters. So Adam and Eve had at least seven children. Of that time, probably four of them were still, or probably five of them, were still alive, including the one woman that Cain took with him. And every one of them knew the principle that the wages of sin is death. Cain had sinned because God made life. Cain had no authority to take it. And so the wages of sin is death. He was afraid to be killed. That's the logic of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I tell you, before we go into the next one soon, thank you for sending these in. These are rolling in nice and quickly, so thank you. You've got some fossils you brought in with you. Yes, I so did let's bring just, some let's fossils have a quick in. Look at those. And You're uh, a long uh, way away over there. They so. are a long way away, so perhaps we'll hold up the big ones first. You see, uh, we've done a lot of dinosaur digs, mm. and you know, folks can go and have a look at some of the results. This one here is a, a Spinosaurus tooth, Howard, and it's big enough to see from where you are. Yeah, it is. This one here is a Mosasaurus tooth, and what most people don't appreciate, say, about dinosaurs, uh, is that, in fact, we could probably play the DVD after I finish this portion because it will tie in quite well. So what you'll find is that the Spinosaurus tooth, the first Spinosaurus, why did it be called that? Had big spines on its back. Right, it was roughly 15 metres or 45 feet long, found in Egypt. Here we have a Mosasaur tooth, and that's from the River Meuse, the monster, the saurus from the River Meuse. And this became a really controversial fossil because, well, Napoleon and some of the others, they all fought over it. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's ended up doing the rounds of quite a few museums and being paid for in huge numbers of bottles of wine, etc. So here we have dinosaurs. Now, Howard, when are they supposed to have died out? Oh, this before us. Before us, that's right. Roughly 65 million years. Us, yeah. Now it's down to 63 and a half, but an awful long time ago. Yeah. Now, so there's the two dinosaur teeth. And the reason I bring that up is they bought another one which will be a little harder to see, but they can go to creationresearch.net, click museum and insert the word thorn. Because over in this corner, is a beautifully preserved fossil thorn. Now it raises the real issue. When you are looking at rocks and fossils, do you accept the dating system of people who weren't there or the paradigm, the worldview of the God who was? Because Howard, when do thorns first get mentioned in the Bible? Well, it's part of the curse, isn't it? That's right. There are no thorns in a good world. Mm. There's only thorns as a result of Adam sinning. Mm. So there's a fossil thorn. 
So you listeners out there, those of you are Christians, particularly those who, like me, tried to put God, evolution, millions of years, the creation story all together, it's think time. You find a fossil thorn. There were no thorns when God made the world. That only comes after Adam sinned. Are you brave enough to say, this rock is not 300 million years old because I found this in the Carboniferous of Nova Scotia and it's got a beautiful thorn, actually officially a spine, but the result is the same. You get the point, I, don't you, Howard? I get the point. Uh, particularly if you fall on it. What you'll find is this rock is technically <coughs> over 300 million years old according to the experts who weren't there. According to the word of God, there were no thorns on the planet, so this rock didn't form until after man sinned. But what's interesting, how it is, you know, these dinosaurs, I hold that one up because it's big. I've really got a little one down there, but you can't see it tonight. In Canada, where I dug this up, I've done a lot of research. Here's the layer with thorns in. Up here is the dinosaur layer. So you've got to be brave enough and say, well, hang on. If this layer didn't get here till after Adam sinned, then the dinosaurs got into the rocks only after Adam yeah, exactly, sinned. Yeah. Yeah. And so really what you're looking at is a real challenge when it comes to fossils. The fossils, number one, never applaud Charles Darwin. Mm. He knew about that. He wrote in his book, The Origin of Species, they're the weakest part of his theory. Mm. Number two, they really do back up God's teaching that it, things produce their own kind. And number three, like the clip from the DVD, you actually will see it's not time, but it's process. You can only form a fossil and keep it well preserved if you bury it quickly, if you bury it deeply, and you bury it in the absence of air. Otherwise, even the thorns on your rose bushes will disintegrate. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We will roll this clip from this uh, Time's Up Darwin DVD and uh, we will speak to you after this. We're just getting ready for a big fossil display here. Have you noticed that people love dead things? Particularly ones like this. A fabulous little starfish still trapped crawling over these fossil shells. He was buried so quickly, he didn't even have time to let go before he became a fossil. And if that impresses you, have a look at what's behind these doors. These have just come from our fossil preparation workshop. How's that? Fantastic fossil trilobites. Oh, try, one, two, three. Lobe, well, you can see the lobes. One, two, three as well. Old word. But have you noticed something? People love to touch dead things. Perhaps they want to get in touch with their real history. But have a look at this one. This one nearly broke our backs as we loaded it up. How's that for spectacular? I mean, the beautiful black marble really sets it off. And these long, thin, pointy things are the shells of squid-like creatures. And you don't have to be Einstein to realise that most of them are pointing in the one direction. They've been washed into place. This is not where they lived. This is just where they're dead. But how did they get to be dead? And how long ago was it? And what does it tell you about your past? Welcome to Australia's Janolan Caves. Huge beautiful and exciting, and now regarded as the oldest open cave system in the world. But when I first went there as a teenager, 
They told us it was only a few thousand years old. Then, in 1999, it went to 100 million years of age. And now it's listed as more than 340 million. And you think you're getting old fast. The same is true for this famous fossil Aussie. In 1910, he was labelled 180 million years old. In 1987, 200 million. But by 1999, it had been both reconfigured and relabeled as 235 million years. There is one more thing you need to know about fossils. You too can see fabulous fossil fishes like this if you visit places like the San Diego Museum. But you'll discover one thing. It's not just enough to be dead to be a fossil. You have to be older than 10,000 years. Now why not 11? Why not 9? The reality is it doesn't matter whether you're a beautifully preserved opalized shell from Australia and you're more than 10,000 years old, or you're a fabulously preserved land plant and sea creature from Germany and you're over 100 million years old. If any of those ages were correct, you could not read Genesis or Exodus as real history. But those ages are just the latest opinions. They're theories. They're not facts. I'm John Mackay. Join me as we travel the globe looking at all the evidence of creation of this wonderful planet that you and I live on. Don't you just love spooky? Caves are about as spooky as you can get. Here in this cave, they used to dig up the, the bat poo and, and process it. That's what these, these trays are left over from, from the Civil War. And they used to turn it into ammunition. I guess that's the original dirty bomb. But just look above me. There's a row of stalactites, only tiny ones. And you only find in this cave the stalactites are on the cracks because that's where the water comes down. I know you go to the tourist caves and they say, don't touch them, don't put your fingerprints on them. They take so long to grow. Actually, they don't take time to grow. That's why they're only on the cracks. That's where the water comes down. Water is the most important part of the process. Time is the least. Let's prove it to you. Right, well, if you want to see what that proof is, you've got to get hold of the DVD. And it's Time's Up Darwin, and you can get it at the telephone number that we're going to put on the screen at the moment. This is going to be a fascinating DVD, I'm it sure. It really is, and uh, yeah. I've just been eight weeks in the UK sharing it around with people, and the response is fabulous from professors and from theologians and from chemists and, and archaeologists and geologists. So it really was a great project, and I'm glad it's finished. It's out there to help people understand it's not the evidence that contradicts Genesis, it's the opinions, the evidence only backs up God because he never lies. So, so why is it, do you think, that if they change their, their thoughts of how old something is, that that bit doesn't creep through to the public, that they've changed the times? Well, you will find that the average person who's an evolutionist has to have an absolute belief. In other words, the minute you say, oh, well, we can no longer believe in Lucy because she really is an Australopithecus, which means Southern Ape, so she's really not the missing link, you never see a big front page headline in the Times apologising. When David Attenborough said this little shrew-like thing, uh, you know, was the missing link, and didn't then they didn't, found out it wasn't. Didn't you, you never admit, didn't you admit in that comment that they hadn't had it before because oh, they finally got it? Obviously, and then it but wasn't. you haven't seen a front-page apology, no. even though you saw a front-page statement that we found the missing link, and it was total fudge land. It really wasn't at all. So, in in other words, there's a pride issue here involved. Now, what you need to realise is God never lies. And the tragedy is when people make up a theory about where we came from and it leaves God out, in the end, their own lies will be caught out. And that's why yeah. this issue is so provocative too. Yeah, of course. OK, well, let's move on to the next uh, email. And thank you for your questions here. It is Q&A. And let's go on. This is from Paul. It says, hi, guys. Did the waters of the deep come up from the ocean trenches that are there now? And these trenches push the land masses apart. OK, thanks, Paul. Um, the ocean trenches that are there now, they've got several interesting characteristics. Say, take the Marianas Trench. Most people don't appreciate that you could take Mount Everest and drop it in the Marianas Trench and still have water above it. 
So some of the holes in the bottom of the ocean are taller than the mountains, the highest mountains are tall. And it led to magazines like, uh, you remember the old Time magazine? And they, they had a Time Life series uh, that they called The Oceans. And one of the fascinating bits of information they had in there was that if you could take all the mountains and drop them in the holes in the bottom of the ocean, you would have enough water to cover the whole earth to a depth of three miles, five kilometres. So you'll find there's plenty of water out there for Noah's flood. But when you ask, did the water coming up from there cause the oceans to part, we need to go back as we did even last night and run over the background of that statement. So that in Genesis chapter 1, you find verses 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, where it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. There's no dry land for another two days, so the world was created covered with water. It was cool. No big bang, no hot molten blob, etc. So you have a cool world, it's covered with water. Day three, it says, God said, let the waters be gathered into one place, singular, unitary. So I would love to see the video of that, Howard. You know, sure. water running around 40,000 kilometres, 25,000 miles, ending up in one spot. Now that's catastrophic. And God lifts up the dry land, but you see that meant that if you lifted up what was inside, the inside became the outside, so the outside has to become the inside. So it shouldn't surprise you that the picture is now one mass of water on the land, but inside there is water underneath. There's fountains in the deep. And when God says the fountains of the deep broke open in Genesis chapter 7, starting verse 11, you'll find that the water is going to come out through those fountains of the deep. And probably you're quite right in going the next step. When we look at the bottoms of the big trenches today, it doesn't matter whether you start in the rift coming down through Jerusalem, end up in the Red Sea, where we've got lots of springs coming out of the bottom of these. Some of them are laden with minerals, so you see huge sheets of calcium sulfate just forming on the bottom. You're not waiting for millions of years of precipitation. These super concentrated um, uh, vents are popping up, but unusually some of them are pumping out water. Right, even fresh water. And so you'll find there's horrendous quantities of water still coming out of these fountains of the deep in one sense. And if the data from China is to be believed, and we have an item on our creationresearch.net uh, museum site, if you just go looking for China or waters underneath, they're reporting huge reservoirs, not just in the aquifers of China, but underneath, which would A, indicate either time from before the flood or flood water still trapped in the basement rocks underneath China. So mm. his basic statement is, is in essence a valid. These are leftover cracks from the time God broke up the earth and uh, brought the fountains up. Mm. That's good. I, I was admit, although I know it, it had never actually, I'd never considered the fact that the earth was covered with, I, I know it was covered yeah. with earth water, yeah. but that hadn't dawned on me. That means, of course, it wasn't a hot molten block. That's right. That's yeah. the Just importance, the importance of knowing the word of God who yeah. was there, because then it means you don't have to be a, a st an atomic physicist to say, I can spot where the Big Bang Theory is wrong. Mm. The world was cool, not hot. Mm. That's good, because I hadn't related the two together. Right, there's one here that said, uh, uh, I was at an outreach, says, Dear Howard and John, I was at an outreach conference seminar called Hasn't Science Buried God recently? And the subject turned out to be very narrow in that it was mainly about origins. The speaker seemed to be someone who believed in old earth creation with God creating the universe millions of years ago and the earth later. This is, we call this the gap theory, don't we? Uh, he seemed to be knocking the literal six day creation, pointing out that a day could be just a period of, pointing out that a day could be just a period of time. Oh, okay, the, yeah, they could just, uh, I'm not going to say he says who it is, I'm not going to say who it is. He said, could you just make a comment on that? And that's from uh, somebody called G. Green. Okay, Mr. G. Green or Miss G. Green. Uh, don't know the gender there, so our apologies if we pick one or the other. But in reality, you'll find any conference entitled Science Has Buried God or Has Science Buried God. Science, well, our normal concept is truth, our normal concept is repeatable testing, uh, modern science has nothing to do with truth, it still has something to do with repeatable testing, but usually words like theory, hypothesis is as far as you're willing to go because they keep changing. Has it buried God? Most people, if you're Christian, you think in terms of the God of Genesis chapter 1. Can I warn you? you need to ask the speaker which God he's talking about may or may not have been buried. So that when you ask them, hey, is this the God of the Bible? 
And he says, well, yes, this is the God of the Bible. And you say, well, hang on, it can't be because the God of the Bible said, I made the world in six days and I rested on the seventh. And when he gave that rule to Moses, Moses is never going to ask him as he's been given the Ten Commandments, hey, God, are each of those days a long period of time? Is there a gap between the first day, uh, the, the morning and the evening of the first day? He's not going to ask any stupid questions like that because the sentence wouldn't have made any sense. So two things. Number one, there's a very well explained answer on our AskJohnMackay.com website about is the day a long period of time? And secondly, I'll give you a thought you may never have thought of. When I count first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth, it's not the same as counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see, I can have seven oranges and pick one of them, but it may not be the first orange in line. So one tells you how many you've got, first tells you where it is. Now go and read Genesis. And we read in our English, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. But you then check your Hebrew, and it's Yom Ikad. The Lord our God is one God, Ikad. Okay, so therefore you'll find that if you wanted to literally translate it into English, you should have put, and the Lord called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were one day. But English people don't tend to think like that because if this was the very first day made, it may well have been one day, but it also would have been the first day. You can follow yeah, that, Howard. Yeah, yeah. So we just slip into the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. But the Hebrew doesn't. The Hebrew has one day. But then it's interesting. It says, and God called the, the you know, in the evening and morning were the second day. It's Yom Shanai. But Shanai happens to be second. You find the same word, and the rivers in Eden broke. The first one went this way, and the second one went that way. So you know that you have two of the same sort. So therefore, when it says God made one day, there is the day that the Lord has made. And then when it says you have a second day, it's not a new day, it's a second one of the same and a third one of the same, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one, and a seventh one. That's why the seventh one doesn't need to end with an evening and a morning, because it's already told you. It didn't even need to have evening and morning from the second day onwards. It's a second one of exactly the same. In fact, now we're up to, what, 15 millionth day yeah. uh, of the same. In fact, that's why you'll find that psalmist who said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it, because God only ever made one day. What's the significance of that day? It was the first day of the week and the light shone in the darkness and Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And that's the day the disciples rejoiced in. He's alive. He's alive. I can touch him. He's real. He's risen from the dead. We will be glad and rejoice in it. So that first day becomes the one day that God made the day the light shone into the darkness, the day the Christians can rejoice in. And if your speaker was trying to say, these are long periods of time, I'm sorry, on judgment day, if he claims to be a Christian, here's the dilemma he's going to face. God's going to look him in the face and say, why did you call me a liar? Because I told you I only ever made one day and I tied salvation to that. Because I told you in Jeremiah chapter 33, if you can change my covenant with the day and the night, which God only, by the way, ever made on that first day, I will change my covenant to put a son of David on the throne of Israel forever. And that person is Jesus Christ. God has kept his covenant. He's never changed the day. There's, there's more involved in it oh, than just a, lot more just than, a simple thing. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm amazed we've got about 15 minutes left, which is incredible. <laughs> Time flies, isn't it? And uh, <coughs> just a quick quick, I could probably answer this myself. Brother John, do you believe man is 6,000 years old and the earth is 4 million years old? God bless Luke. Okay, that's an interesting combination no? of thoughts. <laughs> uh, in this last week, a very interesting paper has come out. One of my friends who's a high-powered researcher in the USA uh, in one of the very advanced medical centres sent it to me because it's all about mutations and increasing numbers of mutations that have been discovered. And uh, he, he, he reports that, you know, the article says, we found most mutations have arisen only in the last 5,000 years. And he makes several comments. One is, this fits a biblical chronology, 
because the biblical chronology is God made the world good. There would have been no mutations. Therefore, Adam and Eve's children could have married each other. There'd be no problems with brother-sister marriages. That will only come later when we get bad genes as a result of devolution, not evolution. But the figure, the mutations have come in the last 5,000 years, doesn't fit the millions of years scenario at all. We know the rate of current mutations, and if you assume the present is the key to the past, we should have already died out from mutations if we'd have been here 3 million years ago. So the long lifespan, whether it's man, whether it's monkeys, whether it's even plants on this planet, the rate of measurable mutations should have killed all life off if you try to make a 4 billion year old Earth. It's bad enough having been only here five to 6,000 years. Our rate of mutation, Howard, is not helping us at all. Oh, you're right. Okay. Well, thank you for that email. There's one here, that, this is probably an interesting question. It's, uh, uh, this is from Alex. It says, uh, hi, John. How close were the building of the pyramids in Egypt to Noah's flood? He's obviously talking time. As I've heard people, some say they were built less than 100 years after the flood, which would not give enough time for the population to have grown to have built them. OK, um, if you have a look at that question, not enough time for the population to have grown to build them, here's your logic. You would take a long time to build a pyramid, so therefore they would have. Now, I warn you, that's uniformitarianism. It's also egotism. We tend to think we're far smarter, and therefore, if we took a long time, those poor primitive people must have taken even longer. Flip the scales a bit. When God made Adam, he was the smartest man on the planet because he was the only one too, wasn't he? Mm. But in reality, he was made in God's image and his IQ was the best it could be. Don't, dis don't, don't mistake IQ for wisdom. When Adam stopped asking God for wisdom, his IQ was not enough to actually run the planet well. So when he sins, wisdom goes out the window, but we're still incredibly smart. You come to Noah, Noah's living a thousand years just about, but at 600 years of age, God asks him to build an ocean liner and Noah shrugs his shoulders and says, OK, okay. I'll do that, yeah. no problem. And he never even went to boat school. He didn't put any life rafts on in case it sank. He didn't load it up to fit the health and safety regs because he got <laughs> it all right, right from the start. Highly intelligent. You probably couldn't even build a paper boat. Noah just went ahead and built an ocean liner of incredible size. Then within 200 years, you have men building a tower. Question, how many people were there on the planet? Read Genesis 11, add them up. You will find there's 70 families. I'm serious. You see, the Tower of Babel story is one of the least understood of all the pictures. Uh, you, you buy picture Bibles, it's not even in it today. Mm. It needs to be there to connect the blacks and the whites and the Chinese and the Arabs and the Jews and the Europeans all back to Noah, back to Adam, because the real problem is not Babel. The real problem is not skin color. The real problem is sin, and you get that from Adam. No. 70 families, no problem building a tower. So even if you only shifted 70 of them to Egypt, same sort of thing. That's what the Egyptian pyramids were, replicas of the Babel attempt. But this time, they weren't any longer trying to storm heaven. They were just trying to get there their own way and build an everlasting monument to themselves. Interesting. Right, we've got a few minutes left. So I want to just bring this one up, the amazing design of life. This is one of your DVDs. Just show that up yes, there. Yes, we'll put the phone number up on the screen. This is okay. a new one as well. Since tell, I tell was, us about this. Yes, uh, uh, on, on the uh, on the um, since I was last on the program. That's what right. I'm trying to say. Okay. But it's Professor Ed Nealand, and one of the things I've really going to like about Ed is a he is one of those scientists that irritates the daylights out of the atheists who keep claiming the skeptics who keep claiming there's no real published scientist who believe in creation. Well, he's one. He's a professor of synthetic chemistry, and so I said, can I interview you about all the evidence that convinces you life was not only created, but he's caused a furor because he says, I believe life was created in six days. Yeah. And one of the things we've asked Ed to do is comment on, okay, you're a professor who puts chemicals together. How old does that tell us dinosaur bones are? And one of his interesting arguments is, well, listen, we find organic stuff like collagen 
inside dinosaur bones, as well as blood and things like that these days. And he said, I work with chemicals and I have bottles of these things and they've got shelf lives on them. You know, keep in fridge, will only last for a year. Don't use after two years and three months. Mm. We've got it even in health and safety regs in the supermarkets these days. Yeah. And he said, every chemical, every organic chemical on this planet, because of the influence of radiation and oxygen, has a shelf life. And he said, the one thing we know about this collagen, it's made up of bonds that will break down after X hundred years. And he said, you would no more have collagen left after four to 5,000 years than your, you'd expect your signature in ink to last in the rain after a couple of weeks. Yeah. And he said, so the finding of these collagen chemicals inside dinosaur bones is wonderful proof they haven't been there for millions of years and interesting evidence they've only been there for thousands so starting at Noah's flood and any catastrophe since and yeah. so Ed's work is a real pointer so amazing design of life available from the UK number on the screen now or look it up via our creationresearch.net yeah. website. We need as, as believers in God, believers in the Bible, we do need this sort of information to be able to hold our own faith solid as well so we don't just say we believe it because we feel it's a good yeah, idea it, right. it backs up what we believe so get hold of these dvds and many other interesting uh, comments on what we see in the earth um i don't know if we have time i think we've probably got time just for one very quick one uh, and this is from john in guernsey it said if there was no rain before the flood would there have been no rivers or surface water dew even heavy ones would not provide enough for life to be sustained how then did plants and animals including humans live without water Thanks for your reply. Okay, come to Australia, come with me down to a place called Eden and you will walk up one of the nearby mountains and up there the council have put a reservoir and basically as you're walking up the mountain, it's almost bone dry. Rain, it's right at the bottom tip of Australia, the winds sort of miss it, but every morning a mist settles down. The bottom half of the mountain is dry, grassy, scrubby forest, right? The top is lush and they have a dam, a reservoir up there to collect the mist. So number one, you can actually get enough water to pile up and you would have running water even in a world where Genesis says in chapter two and verse six, a mist rose up every morning. But there's another way to have rivers that most people have never thought of. You see, there was a river in Eden and there was no rain and it was running. And the reality is when that land was lifted up, and the waters on the outside went inside, you now have another mechanism for having a water cycle. That water inside now has pressure on it, pressure equals heat, hot water rises, the hot water comes up, flows out. In fact, that's probably how you got your mist every morning. As the cool of the night connected with the heat of the water, your mist rose up and it covered the surface of the ground and everything was watered without it raining at all. So you have a reverse cycle up to the time of Noah's flood, so no problem at all. God had it all sorted out. Yeah. Well, we've got, I think, about five minutes or so left. So, John, as, as we conclude this, I know you're doing a few programs while you're here in Spain and I'm going to look forward to seeing many of those. Um, just to clarify, we're talking about the evidence that we find in the ground and what we're saying here is that the evidence, we can look at that, in actual fact, the evidence backs up the biblical story. There's less holes in it than there is evolution. That's correct. So from human's point of view, what is the point, what is, what, what is the purpose? If, if evolution is correct and sin and death were there before Adam, sin sorry and death was in the world before adam sinned what why is this such an important issue for bible believing or christians okay, for several reasons like i was recently in the uk and a young man came up to me now at college and he said i heard you three years ago i came as an atheist hmm. he said i left as an agnostic and two weeks later i could no longer resist the claims of jesus okay. now you ask him why does it matter because if evolution was true, there is no God, there never was a God, I'm just a meaningless blob. Now obviously he wasn't satisfied with that or he wouldn't have even come to listen to me. But he came to argue, had all of his arguments answered without raising one of them, and he left as a, hmm, I'd better go and think about this, right? Mm -hmm. And then within two weeks, the actual evidential basis for Christ 
and the claims of this Christ. I am the way, I am the truth. You want to know God? You can come through me and no other way. And he received Christ. And I'll tell you what, just two weeks ago in a minute, he was bubbling with joy about this Jesus he actually had met. So he knows how important it is. From a doctrinal point of view, you will find that if you connect the dots, you can't start at Matthew. Because Matthew and Luke and all of these, well, take Luke's a great example. He starts in chapter 3 with a chronology and he says, And Jesus, who was the son of Joseph, as it was supposed, who was the son of Heli, who was the son of, who was the son of, and most of us go to sleep reading this stuff. But by the time you get to the end of the chronology, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God, and all of a sudden you're back in Genesis. And so what you'll find is you want to connect the dots from Adam to the last Adam, the first Adam is in Genesis, the last Adam is in John and Mark and Luke. It's Jesus, that's the name the New Testament gives him. The first Adam was made in the image of God, but John's Gospel tells you the God who created was Jesus, so therefore our image was a reflection of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise us when man sinned that it's the Son of God, Jesus, in whose image we were made, is the one who comes down. We were not made in the image of the Holy Spirit. We were not made in the image of God the Father. We were made as the reflection of Jesus. So as you continue to read, when you become a Christian, it keeps talking about you're being restored to the likeness of Jesus. Mm. And that's why that young man was now so attractive. It's why, you know, even my enemies, they, they really tear their hair out. You know, what are we going to do to make you mad? And reality, listen, you can be as mad as you like at me. I'm here to tell you about Jesus, right? And so in reality, what you'll find is you connect all the dots from Genesis to Revelation and you can't leave any bit out. As Jesus said, and you quoted it in our program even today, if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe me. So warning those of you out there who, like me, tried to put God and evolution together, He's going to call you a liar one day unless you accept what he said about what was there. And for those of you who may be bishops and clergy high up, if you teach the people what's wrong, God will hold you accountable for actually teaching them to disbelieve what Moses wrote. And I'll, I'll give you one last warning. The less and less you believe of the Bible, the smaller your Jesus actually gets. You say, I believe in the New Testament Jesus. I'm sorry, that's that big. The whole of Jesus is from Genesis as creator, right through the law, he's the judge, right through Jesus as the saviour, right through to the final coming of Jesus as Lord and God in the new heavens and the new earth. Don't make Jesus this big when he's really everything there is. That's right. Well, I think that's the whole point that if we don't understand the Old Testament, or at least have a, a reasonable understanding of it, it the New Testament doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, we, we're just sort of wobbling about on a loose yep. thing. And the other thing, of course, is that it's good that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, can know that the Bible that we have in our hands today can be trusted. And if we can't trust it in some of these natural things, how on earth can we trust it in the spiritual? But we know that we can trust it in the spiritual because the natural backs it up. John, thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to the next time you're with us. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.